Okay, it's okay. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> Welcome back. <laughs> okay. Mm. Hello, everyone. Happy to see you back on our channel. Uh, this is chapter two, third book. Yay. Well, I haven't posted the first chapter yet because... You um, have not? No. Why? Because it takes up so much of our bandwidth for like 12 hours. What? Like it's a big commitment on our internet. To edit it? Oh, to post it. No, no, to it. actually post it. Oh. I've edited it. It's done. Oh, I finished oh. that. I finished it weeks ago. But I just haven't posted it because I keep thinking, ah, I kind of need the internet today and... And then I thought, you know what? What if I work? What if I read? Yeah, but it'll ruin your internet. I think. Okay. What if I read and begin editing the second chapter, and yeah. then post the, cha the first chapter, and then read the third chapter? Like, what if I read? Mm. Post, you gotta cut these bits that you're. Yeah. This way. Yeah. 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 But anyway. Chapter three. Do the thing. Chapter three. Um, Mars, big oh. mistake. I can't see, sorry. Aunt Marge's big it's mistake. Big, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Does that sound good? No. Mm, no? Okay. Manelli's got the headphones in for the... It's, whoa, sounds amazing. Harry went down to breakfast next morning to find the three Dursleys already sitting around the kitchen table. They were watching a brand new television, a welcome home for the summer present for Dudley who had been complaining loudly about the long walk between the fridge and the television in the living room. Dudley had spent most of the summer in the kitchen, his piggy little eyes fixed on the screen and his five chins wobbling as he ate continually. Harry sat down between Dudley and Uncle Vernon, a large beefy man with... Oh, no. Here. Come on. Right, actually, he box. Ooh. Do you want another box? Yeah, that's a good looking box, isn't it? There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an amazing present. Wow. Oh, my. Okay. Uncle Vernon, a large beefy man with very little neck and a lot of moustache, far from wishing Harry a happy birthday, None of the Dursleys gave any sign that they had noticed Harry enter the room, but Harry was far too used to this to care. He helped himself to a piece of toast and then looked up at the newsreader on the television, who was halfway through a report on an escaped convict. The public is warned that Black is armed and extremely dangerous. A special hotline has been set up, and any sighting of Black should be reported immediately. No need to tell us he's no good snorted Uncle Vernon, start staring over the top of his newspaper at the prisoner. Look at the state of him, the filthy layabout. Look at his hair. He shot a nasty look sideways at Harry, whose untidy hair had always been a source of great annoyance to Uncle Vernon. Compared to the man on the television, however, whose gaunt face was surrounded by a matted elbow-length tangle, Harry felt very well-groomed indeed. The newsreader had reappeared, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries will announce today... Hang on, barked Uncle Vernon, staring furiously at the newsreader. You didn't tell us where the maniacs escaped from. What use is that? Lunatic could be coming up the street right now. Aunt Petunia, who was bony and horse-faced, whipped around and peered intently out of the kitchen window. Harry knew Aunt Petunia would simply love to be the one to call the hotline number. She was the nosiest woman in the world and spent most of her life spying on her boring, law-abiding neighbours. "'When will they learn?' said Uncle Vernon, pounding the table with his large purple fist. "'That hanging's the only way to deal with these people.' Mm, "'Very true,' said Aunt Petunia, who was still squinting into next door's runner, runner beans. Uncle Vernon drained his teacup, glanced at his watch, and added, "'I'd better be off in a minute, Petunia. Marge's train gets in at ten. Harry, whose thoughts had been upstairs with the broomstick servicing kit, was brought back to earth with an unpleasant bump. Aunt Marge, he blurted out, she's she's not coming here, is she? Aunt Marge was Uncle Vernon's sister. Even though she was not a blood relative of Harry's, whose mother had been Aunt Petunia's sister, 
He had been forced to call her aunt all his life. Aunt Marge lived in the country, in a house with a large garden, where she bred bulldogs. She didn't often stay in Privet Drive, because she couldn't bear to leave her precious dogs. But each of her visits stood out horribly vividly in Harry's mind. At Dudley's fifth birthday party, Aunt Marge had whacked Harry around the shins with her walking stick to stop him beating Dudley at musical statues. A few years later, she had turned up at Christmas with a computerised robot for Dudley and a box of dog biscuits for Harry. On her last visit, the year before Harry had started at Hogwarts, Harry had accidentally trodden on the paw of her favourite dog. Ripper had chased Harry out into the garden and up a tree, and Aunt Marge had refused to call him off until past midnight. The memory of this incident still brought tears of laughter to Dudley's eyes. Marge will be here for a week, Uncle Vernon snarled. And while we're on the subject, he pointed a fat finger threateningly at Harry. We need to get a few things straight before I go and collect her. Dudley smirked and withdrew his gaze from the television. Watching Harry being bullied by Uncle Vernon was Dudley's favourite form of entertainment. Firstly, growled Uncle Vernon, You'll keep a civil tongue in your head when you're talking to Marge. All right, said Harry bitterly, if she does when she's talking to me. Secondly, said Uncle Vernon, acting as though he had not heard Harry's reply, as Marge doesn't know anything about your abnormality, I don't want any any funny stuff while she's here. You behave yourself. Got me? I will if she does, said Harry through gritted teeth. And thirdly, said Uncle Vernon, his mean little eyes now slits in his great purple face. We've told Marge you attend St. Brutus's Secure Centre for Incurably Criminal Boys. What? Harry yelled. And you'll be sticking to that story, boy, or there'll be trouble, spat Uncle Vernon. Harry sat there, white-faced and furious, staring at Uncle Vernon, hardly able to believe it. Aunt Marge coming for a week-long visit. It was the worst birthday present the Dursleys had ever given him, including that pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Well, Petunia, said Uncle Vernon, getting heavily to his feet, I'll be off to the station then. Want to come along for the ride, Dudders? No, said Dudley, whose attention had returned to the television now that Uncle Vernon had finished threatening Harry. Dudley's got to make himself smart for his auntie, said Aunt Petunia, smoothing Dudley's thick blonde hair. Mummy's brought him a lovely new bow tie. Uncle Vernon clapped Dudley up, up on his porky shoulder. See you in a bit then, he said, and he left the kitchen. Harry, who had been sitting in a kind of horrified trance, had a sudden idea. Abandoning his toast, he got quickly to his feet and followed Uncle Vernon to the front door. Uncle Vernon was pulling on his car coat. I'm not taking you, he snarled as he turned to see Harry watching him. Like I wanted to come, said Harry coldly. I want to ask you something. Uncle Vernon eyed him suspiciously. Third years at Hog at at my school are allowed to visit the village sometimes, said Harry. So, snapped Uncle Vernon, taking his car keys from the hook next to the door. I need you to sign the permission form, said Harry in a rush. And why should I do that? sneered Uncle Vernon. Well, said Harry, choosing his words carefully. It'll be hard work, pretending to Aunt Marge that I go to St. Watsits. St. Brutus's Secure Centre for Incurably Criminal Boys, bellowed Uncle Vernon, and Harry was pleased to hear a definite note of panic in Uncle Vernon's voice. Hmm, yeah, exactly, said Harry, looking calmly up into Uncle Vernon's large purple face. For criminal boys? Yeah. St. Aww. Brutus's secure centre for incurably criminal boys. It's virtually juby. That's crazy. Hmm. Okay. It's a lot to remember. I'll have to make it sound convincing, won't I? What if I accidentally let something slip? You'll get the stuffing knocked out of you, won't you? roared Uncle Vernon, advancing on Harry with his fist raised. But Harry stood his ground. Knocking the stuffing out of me won't make Aunt Marge forget what I could tell her, he said grimly. Uncle Vernon stopped, his fist still raised, his face an ugly puce. But if you sign my permission form, Harry went on quickly, I swear I'll remember where I'm supposed to go to school, and I'll act like a mug, like I'm normal and everything. 
Harry could tell that Uncle Vernon was thinking it over, even if his teeth were barred and a vein was throbbing in his temple. Right, he snapped finally. I shall monitor your behaviour care- behavior carefully during Marge's visit. If, at the end of it, you've towed the line and kept to the story, I'll sign your ruddy form. He wheeled around, pulled open the front door and slammed it hard so that one of the little panes of glass at the top fell out. Harry didn't return to the kitchen. He went back upstairs to his bedroom. If he was going to act like a real muggle, he'd better start now. Slowly and sadly, he gathered up all his presents and his birthday cards and hid them under the loose floorboard with his homework. Then he went to Hedwig's cage. Errol seemed to have recovered. He and Hedwig were both asleep, heads under their wings. Harry sighed, then poked them both awake. Hedwig, he said gloomily, you're going to have to clear off for a week. Go with Errol. Ron will look after you. I'll write him a note explaining. And don't look at me like that. Hedwig's large amber eyes were reproachful. It's not my fault. It's the only way I'll be allowed to visit Hogsmeade with Ron and Hermione. Ten minutes later, Errol and Hedwig, who had a note to Ron bound to her leg, soared out of the window and out of sight. Harry now feeling thoroughly miserable, put the empty cage away inside the wardrobe. But Harry didn't have long to brood. In next to no time, Aunt Petunia was shrieking up the stairs for Harry to come down and get ready to welcome their guest. Do something about your hair, Aunt Petunia snapped as he reached the hall. Harry couldn't see the point of trying to make his hair fly flat. Aunt Marge loved criticising him, so the untidier he looked, the happier she would be. All too soon, there was a crunch of gravel outside as Uncle Vernon's car pulled back into the driveway. Then, the clunk of the car doors and footsteps on the garden path. Get the door, Aunt Petunia hissed at Harry. A feeling of great gloom in his stomach, Harry pulled the door open. On the threshold stood Aunt Marge. She was very like Uncle Vernon, large, beefy, and purple-faced. She even had a moustache though not as bushy as his. In one hand, she held an enormous suitcase, and tucked under the other was an old and evil-tempered bulldog. "'Where's my Dudders?' roared Aunt Marge. "'Where's my Neffy Pooh?' Dudley came waddling down the hall, his blonde hair plastered flat to his fat head, a bow tie just visible under his many chins. Aunt Marge thrust the suitcase into Harry's stomach, knocking the wind out of him. Seized Dudley in a tight one-armed hug, and planted a large kiss on his cheek. Harry knew perfectly well that Dudley only put up with Aunt Marge's hugs because he was well paid for it, and sure enough, when they broke apart, Dudley had a crisp 20-pound note clutched in his fat fist. Petunia! shouted Aunt Marge, striding past Harry as though he was a hat stand. Aunt Marge and Aunt Petunia kissed, or rather, Aunt Marge bumped her large jaw against Aunt Petunia's bony cheekbone. Uncle Vernon now came in, smiling jovially as he shut the door. Tea, Marge, he said. And what will Ripper take? Ripper can have some tea out of my saucer, said Aunt Marge, as they all trooped into the kitchen, leaving Harry alone in the hall with the suitcase. But Harry wasn't complaining. Any excuse not to be with Aunt Marge was fine by him, so he began to heave the case upstairs into the spare bedroom, taking as long as he could. By the time he got back to the kitchen, Aunt Marge had been supplied with tea and fruitcake, and Ripper was lapping noisily in the corner. Harry saw Aunt Petunia wince slightly as specks of tea and drool flecked her clean floor. Aunt Petunia hated animals. "'Who's looking after the other dogs, Marge?' Uncle Vernon asked. "'Oh, I've got Colonel Fubster managing them,' boomed Aunt Marge. "'He's retired now. Good for him to have something to do. But I couldn't leave poor old Ripper.' He pines if he's away from me. Ripper Ripper began to growl again as Harry sat down. This directed Aunt Marge's attention to Harry for the first time. So, she barked, still here, are you? Yes, said Harry. Don't say yes in that ungrateful tone, Aunt Marge growled. It's damn good of Vernon and Petunia to keep you. Wouldn't have done it myself. You'd have gone straight to an orphanage if you'd been dumped on my doorstep. Harry was bursting to say that he'd rather live in an orphanage than with the Dursleys. But the thought of the Hogsmeade form stopped him. He forced his face into a painful smile. Don't you smirk at me, boomed Aunt Marge. 
I can see you haven't improved since I last saw you. I hope school would knock some manners into you. She took a large gulp of tea, wiped her moustache, and said, Where is it that you send him again, Vernon? St. Brutus's, said Uncle Vernon promptly. It's a first-rate institution for hopeless cases. Mm, I see, said Armage. Do they use the cane at St. Brutus's boy? She barked across the table. Um, Uncle Vernon nodded curtly behind Aunt Marge's back. Yeah, yes, said Harry. Then, feeling he might as well do the thing properly, he added, All the time. Excellent, said Aunt Marge. I won't have this namby-pamby, wishy-washy nonsense about not hitting people who deserve it. A good thrashing is what's needed in 99 cases out of 100. Have you been beaten often? Oh, yeah, said Harry. Loads of times. Aunt Marge narrowed her eyes. I still don't like your tone, boy, she said. If you can speak of your beatings in that casual way, they clearly aren't hitting you hard enough, Petunia. What? I'd write if I were you. Make it clear that you approve the use of extreme force in this boy's case. What awful boy. Perhaps Uncle Vernon was worried that Harry might forget their bargain. In any case, he changed the subject abruptly. Heard the news this morning, Marge? What about that escaped prisoner, eh? As Aunt Marge stared, started to make herself at home, Harry caught himself thinking almost longingly of life at number four without her. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia usually encouraged Harry to stay out of their way, which Harry was only too happy to do. Aunt Marge, on the other hand, wanted Harry under her eye at all times so that she could boom out suggestions for his improvement. She delighted in comparing Harry with Dudley, and took huge pleasure in buying Dudley expensive presents while glaring at Harry, as though daring him to ask why he hadn't got a present too. She also kept throwing out dark hints about what made Harry such an unsatisfactory person. You mustn't blame yourself for the way the boys turned out, Vernon, she said over over lunch on the third day. If there's something rotten on the inside, there's nothing anyone can do about it. Harry tried to concentrate on his food, but his hands shook, and his face was starting to burn with anger. Remember the form, he told himself. Think about Hogsmeade. Don't say anything. Don't rise. Aunt Marge reached for her glass of wine. It's one of the basic rules of breeding, she said. You see it all the time with dogs. If there's something wrong with the bitch, there'll be something wrong with the pup. At that moment, the wine glass Aunt Marge was holding exploded in her hand. Shards of glass flew in every direction, and Aunt Marge spluttered and blinked, her great ruddy face dripping. Marge, squealed Aunt Petunia. Marge, are you all right? Not so worry, grunted Aunt Marge, mopping her face with a napkin. Must have squeezed it too hard. Did the same thing at Colonel Fubster's the other day. No need to fuss. Petunia, I have a very firm grip. But Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon were both looking at Harry suspiciously, so he decided he'd better skip pudding and escape from the table as soon as he could. Outside in the hall, he leant against the wall, breathing deeply. It had been a long time since he'd lost control and made something explode. He couldn't afford to let it happen again. The Hogsmeade form wasn't the only thing at stake. If he'd carried on like that, he'd be in trouble with the Ministry of Magic. Harry was still an underage wizard, and he was forbidden by wizard law to do magic outside school. His record wasn't exactly clean either. Only last summer, he'd got an official warning which had stated quite clearly that if the Ministry got wind of any more magic in Privet Drive, Harry would face expulsion from Hogwarts. He heard the Dursleys leave the table and hurried upstairs out of the way. Harry got through the next three days by forcing himself to think about his handbook of do-it-yourself broom care whenever Aunt Marge started on him. This worked quite well, though it seemed to give him a glazed look because Aunt Marge started voicing the opinion that he was mentally subnormal. At last, at long last, the final evening of Marge's stay arrived. Aunt Petunia cooked a fancy dinner, and Uncle Vernon uncorked several bottles of wine. They got all the way through the soup and the salmon without a single mention of Harry's faults. During the lemon meringue pie, Uncle Vernon bored them all with long talk about Grunnings, his drill-making company. Then Aunt Petunia made coffee, and Uncle Vernon brought out a bottle of brandy. Can I tempt you, Marge? Aunt Marge had already had a rather lot of wine. Her huge face was very red. Just a small one, then, she chuckled. A a, a bit more than that. A a bit more. 
That's the boy. Dudley was eating his fourth slice of pie. Aunt Petunia was sipping coffee with her little finger sticking out. Harry really wanted to disappear into his bedroom, but he met Uncle Vernon's angry little eyes and he knew he would have to sit it out. Ah, said Aunt Marge, smacking her lips and putting the empty brandy glass back down. Excellent nosh, Petunia. It's normally just a fry-up for me on an evening, with twelve dogs to look after. She burped richly and patted her great tweed stomach. Pardon me, but I do like to see a healthy-sized boy, she went on, winking at Dudley. You'll be a proper-sized man, Dudders, like your father. Yes. Mm. Ew, not to body shame, but... What? What's wrong with her? Okay. Yes. I'll have a spot more brandy, Vernon. Now this one here, she jerked her head at Harry, who felt his stomach clench. The handbook, he thought quickly. This one's got a mean, runty look about him. You get that with dogs. I'd Colonel Fubster down one last year. Ratty little thing it was. Weak, underbred. Harry was trying to remember page 12 of his book, A Charm to Cure Reluctant Reverses. It all comes down to blood. As I was saying the other day, bad blood will out. Now, I'm saying nothing against your family, Petunia. She patted Aunt Petunia's bony end with her shovel-like one. But your sister was a bad egg. They turn up in the best families. Then she ran off with a wastrel, and here's the result right in front of us. Harry was staring at his plate, a funny ringing in his ears. Grasp your broom firmly by the tail, he thought. But he couldn't remember what came next. Aunt Marge's voice seemed to be boring into him like one of Uncle Vernon's drills. This potter, said Aunt Marge loudly, seizing the brandy bottle and splashing more into her glass and over the tablecloth. You never told me what he did. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia were looking extremely tense. Dudley had even looked up from his pie to gape at his parents. He, uh, he didn't work, said Uncle Vernon, with a half glance at Harry. Unemployed, as I expected, said Aunt Marge, taking a huge swig of brandy and wiping her chin on her sleeve. A no-account, good-for-nothing, lazy scrounger who... He was not, said Harry suddenly. The table went very quiet. Harry was shaking all over. He had never felt so angry in his life. More brandy, yelled Uncle Vernon, who had gone very white. He emptied the bottle into Marge's glass. You boy. He snarled at Harry. Go to bed. Go on. No, Vernon, hiccuped Aunt Marge, holding up a hand her tiny bloodshot eyes fixed on Harry. Go on. Boy. Go on. Proud of your parents, are you? They go and get themselves killed in a car crash. Drunk, I expect. They didn't die in a car crash, said Harry, who found himself on his feet. They died in a car crash, you nasty little liar, and left you to be a burden on their decent, hard-working relatives, screamed Aunt Marge, swelling with fury. You're an insolent, ungrateful little... But Aunt Marge suddenly stopped speaking for a moment. Sorry, wait, she's even worse hmm. in this book. Yeah. Like, they obviously they didn't give her enough screen time, but like... She didn't even last one day in the movie. <laughs> she lasted a whole week in the book. Yeah. Okay. But Aunt Marge suddenly stopped speaking for a moment. It looked as though words had failed her. She seemed to be swelling with inexpressible anger, but the swelling didn't stop. Her great red face started to expand, her tiny eyes bulged, and her mouth stretched too tightly for speech. Next second, several buttons burst from her tweed jacket and pinged off the walls. She was inflating like a monstrous balloon, her stomach bursting free of her tweed waistband, each of her fingers blowing up like a salami. Marge! yelled Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia together, as Aunt Marge's whole body began to rise off her chair towards the ceiling. She was entirely round now, like a vast life boy with piggy eyes, and her hands and feet stuck out weirdly as she drifted up into the air, making apoplectic popping noises. Ripper came skidding into the room, barking loudly. No! Uncle Vernon seized one of Marge's feet and tried to pull her down again, but was almost lifted from the floor himself. Next second, Ripper had leapt forward and sunk his teeth into Uncle Vernon's leg. Harry tore from the dining room before anyone could stop him, heading for the cupboard under the stairs. The cupboard next door burst magically open as he reached it in seconds. He had heaved his trunk to the front door 
He sprinted upstairs and threw himself under the bed, wrenched up the loose floorboards, and grabbed the pillowcase full of his books and birthday presents. He wriggled out, seized Hedwig's empty cage, and dashed back downstairs to his trunk. Just as Uncle Vernon burst out of the dining room, his trouser leg in bloody tatters, "'Come back in here!' he bellowed. "'Come back and put her right!' But a reckless rage had come over Harry. He kicked his trunk open, pulling out his wand and pointed it at Uncle Vernon. "'She deserved it,' Harry said, breathing very fast. "'She deserved what she got. You keep away from me.' He fumbled behind him for the catch on the door. "'I'm going,' Harry said. "'I've had enough.' And next moment, he was out in the dark, quiet street, heaving his heavy trunk behind him. Hedwig's cage under his arm. There we go. That's that chapter. Yeah. Okay, I don't feel like anything happened that I'll go like, oh, like, oh, it's so different. Let's let's just do this. No. That goes on your left. What are you you doing? There we go. Okay. Oof. Yeah. Nothing really that happened good. that I'm gonna go like ooh. I don't know, the first chapters she wasn't as detailed as she is mm-hmm. here. So she had more lines to be a worse person than she is. That's yeah. loud, isn't it? Yeah, yeah don't you? As she was in the movie. It's pretty loud in real life to be fair. Um that dog is really cute. It's a bulldog. No, in the drawings. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't like bulldogs, but I did. Um. Um. Just mean lady. Very mean. Saying you should hit Harry more so he won't laugh at it and stuff. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Excuse him, more? <laughs> what? It was it was pretty similar to what they did in the movie because it's a great yeah. chapter. Like I think um, Alfonso Caran when he was making it, I probably said his name awfully wrong, but I think he was like, "This is a pretty funny chapter. I can mm. I can do something with this." And yeah. he just Instead of I week, told you just... <laughs> when I was a kid, that chapter like made me laugh so mm. much. Even though you know I'm an empath, by the way, or something, I always get even for the villains really sad. If something re- like that happens, that it's going to like embarrass them. But for her, it was the only character when I was a kid that I was like, ha, ah, good. Good that happened to you. Like, I would watch the third movie to be like, ha-ha. Like, it was really good. Um, we did get a little hint as to Sirius Black escaping, however. Yeah, uh, going from the um, prison. Yeah, I think it was actually in the movie, like, kind of in the background of the news. and then kind of, Yeah. I think they were also talking about... No. In Muggles News? No, I don't think it was in the movie, yeah. actually. But, yeah, they were like, where, where is he? Mm. And uh, they were very... Apparently, the newscaster, like, was just very vague about the information. It's like, just be on the lookout for this man. And they showed his picture. But, like, they couldn't actually reveal any extra information because then it would be like, well, who is okay. he? Where did he come from? What's he done? You know? So they just kind of said, like, he's insane. Just look out for him. Mm. Um, and, again, like the first chapters, you know, still kind of in the first three chapters where they're introducing the characters again. Like, it was their way of reintroducing the Dursleys because, you know, how in the last chapter they're like, this is Harry. This is what he's like. This is his friend, Harry and Hermione. And they kind of described them. This chapter introduced the Dursleys, and they were like, you know, Aunt Petunia, like, she would definitely be the first person, like, want to catch the guy on the neighborhood watch, and, and like, oh, she's concerned about the neighbors, you know, beans or whatever. And they're like, Uncle Vernon, like, he's fat. He's really, really fat. Did you know he's fat? Because they said it like 20 times, and then Dudley, they're like, he's got 16 chins. Like, she's very concerned with describing what they look like as well. Like, she's. She's bony and horse-faced, and he's fat, you know. So, I don't know. She's she's very descriptive about what Harry, Ron, and Hermione are like in terms of personality. But others like And then with people that she doesn't like, villains, she's like, they just look awful. And it's like, mm. okay, it is a children's book. I suppose that's a decent way to... Um, like, good 
observations yeah good job thank you yeah it's good for the school kids if you're analyzing the chapter um <laughs> the other thing was how aunt marge kind of described uh harry's parents and this was in the movie too but it's just something i just noticed then and i have probably never thought about uh but the reason that harry got really mad the thing that sent him over the edge like the final straw yeah was when they were like he was unemployed and he was like they were not do you know what job harry's parents had the wizards no they were unemployed oh marge was right they didn't have a job. That's well, okay. They were young, weren't they? They were like in their low twenties or something yeah. like that. Um, but like they were kind of like full time a part of the Order of the Phoenix. Yeah. But the reason they were able to do that is because, and I think we spoke about uh, this. Even if they were unemployed, I'm sorry, it might trigger a lot of people. Be like, ooh, like were they rich? They put a lot of money for Harry, so they probably had an income coming from somewhere. Yes, it was inheritance. Like, yeah. Well, remember, um, if they were unemployed where they had money, that's why they probably didn't I can't work. Remember what it was. We did speak about this last book. Uh, one of Harry's like great 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 mm. great grandfathers, whatever. I don't, yeah, I don't you know. It's probably yeah, not yeah. that far back. Invented a potion. Yeah. And it literally even came up in the last book. Was it a love potion? No. That no, was it wasn't not. a love potion. It was like a potion that was in the book. And I remember I was like, oh, that's right. He invented that potion. Yeah, I remember he told yeah. me I forgot the what potion. Tell us in the yeah. comments. I can't remember. Yeah. I knew it when I read it. I was like, oh, that's it. That's the one. Yeah. Um, But yeah, like they didn't have jobs. They were never going to get jobs is my point. Like, I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm just saying that like. That's the, what that's what we want, isn't it? Yeah. Like. Stop doing that. But the Dursleys were criticizing them for this, and Harry was like, no, that's wrong. But, like... That's right. Harry Harry is a child, and yes, he's a wizard, and they have different sort of... Yeah, you probably didn't of, understand. ...of it, culture yeah. and society. And, and look, if I was a wizard, I'd probably be unemployed too, because you can just conjure anything that you need, right? You know? Um, I mean, the Weasleys have job, well... The dad's got a job, but, like, realistically, they don't really need a job. Like, they just do whatever they want with magic. I mean, then the argument that they're poor will go away. Then they're not poor. I mean, they can't afford to buy wizarding goods, but the essentials, oh, okay. they can conjure that. Okay, got like, it. Pretty easily. Yeah. Like, they're not going to be able to go buy Ron an amazing new wand or a fire. Can they, ball. like... Build a very fancy house with magic. I think they could if they were good enough at magic and if their imagination was good enough to, you know, architecturally design a building. I think that's why the borough is kind of mishmash and put together. So we would be really if we had magic, we would make the best house ever. Mm-hmm. I think they'd also have to have the materials as well, but like. Yeah, okay. So. I don't know, they could go to a tree, magic it up into timber, engorgio, make it bigger, like, mm. I'm yeah. sure there would be a way. The problem would be if it was, uh, like, depending on what sort of spell work it was, if the caster dies, some spells, like, dissipate, and then some don't, so, I don't know. I've never thought about it. I've never thought about magical architecture much. Except for the tent that, like, you go in, it's really big. Because I wish we had that. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Um, Hedwig, like, got sent out to the to the Weasleys. I don't know. The dogs. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Fat as well. They describe the dog as fat, which is like, oh, so that tells you that the dog's mm-hmm. a mean dog as well. Even though, like, we're looking at the pictures. That's so mean? What? So, because the dog is fat, is the dog is mean? Yeah, I think that's that's what J.K. Rowling's done by describing their appearance. And so because, whoever is fat is me? Yeah. Yeah, J.K. Rowling, fat shaming. Amazing. Um, but yeah, I think because the dog is owned what? by Aunt Marge and there's kind of a hint that, like, oh, he's fussy and he'll complain if I'm not there. Like, I think they're kind of inferring that it's, it's like, a bad dog that's kind of like her. It's got her personality. I mean... Opportunia is skinny. She's mean. 
For yes, sure but see, she's she's like the polar polar opposite of like the super fat because she's really bony, she's skeletal, and I think they're setting up like that spectrum where if you're in the middle, you're normal. You know, if you're not described, if you're not abnormal, whereas if you're on either end of the spectrum, you're different. And, like, the Dursleys are always complaining. That's not that. a good way to describe someone that is me. It's a good technique to like get it. to, to make it clear to children that they are different. And being different okay. is bad to a kid, you know. It's not necessarily true, but it's just a really clear way to okay. to make kids know. They're like, mm, that person, Maybe look out for them. Say it, yeah. to say it it's a children's book, so some people may go, that's problematic, but it's like, you know, come on. Um, but yeah, this was a pretty short chapter realistically and everything was in the movie. So I don't think there's really anything new for you. No. Um, but yeah, I'll put the pictures in because like, yes, look at the hair. Look how, look how different look she is. Hair. Yes. Also, she has a mustache. I thought that was pretty funny <laughs> and how like shoes exploded and this, like imagine Sausage if they, finger. they did a really good job of the movie, but imagine if they did that. Mm. Whoa. Balloons. Uh, yeah, no. Excited it. for the next chapter. The next chapter is the night boss. I know you love that one. Love I also it. Get love to the get Lego. Out. I get to get out. <gasps> they can part. bring my cousin's Lego for the like the prop here. Does he have a bus? Yeah. Oh, cool. And it moves inside. So cool. Does it have the little Ch- chit thing? Um, yeah, 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 yeah it does. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Let's steal it. They can just... I bet you they don't watch our channel, so... Give it to me. Let's steal. (laughs) Okay. Thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it. Oh my god, did I scream? I'm so sorry. Yeah, that hurt my ear a bit. Okay. Sounds Um, good, though. I'm gonna say it again, so people will... Thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it a lot. Hope to see you soon. Bye. See ya. Bye. Did the camera click off at any point? No, I didn't hear anything. That was good. That was a good little trick then.